Welcome to The Bridgehead with Jonathan Van Maren, bringing you cutting-edge news, commentary, and interviews from the front lines of the culture wars. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead on AM 1380 at 3 o'clock p.m. And I have to say that I'm really excited about the show we have today because we're talking to two very exceptional men uh, doing something extremely exceptional. Now, a lot of us uh, as Christians have watched with a sort of uh, despair and helplessness as we've seen the situation unfold across Iraq and the Middle East as this sort of new group of barbarians, uh, often referred to as ISIS or ISIL, is, is doing absolutely horrifying things to Christians, and, and they're renowned now for their bizarre methods of execution, of photos of lines of Christians on the beach in orange jumpsuits having their heads sawed off uh, by ISIS militants, of, of the slave markets in which they've sold thousands of women and children into sex slavery. Uh, these, these people are, are being raped by ISIS militants whose perverse version of Islam supposedly permits them uh, to do these things. And one of the reasons that these situations have seemed so out of reach is because no one knows how to rescue uh, these children. No one knows how to rescue these women. And, and even in our national political debates, uh, people seem unaware of exactly how to approach this. Should we uh, support bombing missions against ISIS? Should we put boots on the ground to try and rescue these people? Well, obviously this situation, uh, whose horrors have gained so much attention around the world and has really drawn a lot of attention to the wide-scale and global persecution of Christians like never before, has been noticed by a, a lot of very important people. And I'm going to be interviewing two of those people uh, today on this radio show. So the first uh, man that I'm going to be interviewing is a man named Lord George Weddenfield. And as that title would indicate, he's a, he's a member of the British House of Lords. And he was born in, in Vienna, Australia. But following the annexation of Austria by Nazi Germany in 1938, he was forced to flee. And he was able to successfully flee to Great Britain because a Christian family took him in and, in his words, treated him like a son. So uh, Lord George Weddenfield is now 95 years old, but he made headlines recently for deciding that what he wanted to do was he wanted to engage in a rescue mission of Christians because he felt like he owed a debt to those Christians. He wanted to repay the debt of those who had gone uh, before him and also rescued people during their time of need. And of course, he's talking about the many, many Christians across Europe and indeed elsewhere who decided to, at great risk to themselves, uh, rescue Jews that were at threat of extermination uh, in the Holocaust, of course, being perpetrated by Nazi Germany. And he has taken a strong stand against ISIS, and he wants to repay that debt by rescuing as many many Christian families as he can. He has an extremely ambitious plan to rescue thousands of families, to airlift them out of the Middle East and rescue them. He actually told the Times that he had a debt to repay. It applies to so many young people, he said, who were on the kinder transports. It was Quakers and other Christian denominations who brought these children to England. It was a very high-minded operation, and we Jews should also be thankful and do something for the endangered Christians. The primary objective is to bring Christians to safe havens. ISIS is unprecedented in its primitive savagery compared with the more sophisticated Nazis. When it comes to pure lust for horror and sadism, they are unprecedented. There was never such scum as these people. Now, these are obviously very strong words, but for those of you who, like me, have seen headlines of Christians being crucified, uh, beheaded, brutally mutilated, of Christian men forced to watch as ISIS fighters sexually assaulted uh, their wives and their daughters, as wives and daughters were forced to watch while Christian men, their sons, their brothers, their fathers, were beheaded and tortured in front of them, uh, these words can't convey truly just how horrific the ISIS savages 
are. So I'm very pleased to welcome Lord George Weddenfield from London, England to the program where he tells us just a bit about why he's doing what he's doing and why he thinks uh, that we can make a difference. Can you tell us a little bit about your decision to help rescue Christians from the Middle East? Uh, There are two considerations which prompted me, which are highly personal. First of all, it was a family of uh, evangelical Christians called Plymouth Brethren who um, helped me when I fled Nazi Austria and spent, uh, came to England and for a year I stayed in their house and they treated me like a child and I continued my studies and then I got a job with the BBC when war broke out. But they also saved my parents' life because my father was um, in prison. He was then released and had to leave quickly so as not to be re-imprisoned into a concentration camp. And these very nice people came with me to the British Home Office and uh, pledged their financial support so they could get a visa. So they saved my parents' life. That was one consideration. The other consideration was that I was a, in a privileged position to be part of a group that Pope John Paul II, the Polish Pope Wojtyla, entertained once a year at his summer residence in Castel Gandolfo over a period of about a dozen or so years, where Jews and Christian academics and media people of East and West Europe met for a social weekend, you might say, and discussed problems of history and politics in a sort of rather lofty way. And it's there that Pope John Paul II made the famous remark to me before he made it publicly, the Jew is the elder brother of the church, and he was very, very concerned with the fate of Jews. As a young priest in Krakow during the war, he said that during his waking hours at night, he could hear the moaning of the prisoners in Auschwitz a few kilometers away. So the combination of this personal experience, on the one hand, as a the recipient of love and help uh, by a Christian family, on the one hand. On the other hand, the uh, privilege of hearing the Pope say, the Jew is the elder brother of the church. I was prompted when I heard that there's not enough had been done by Christian families in the Mosul area under the immediate threat of barbarism of these um, human barbarians um, of ISIS. So I tried to bring two networks together, a Jewish network that would be responsible for getting the funds and the Christian networks that would have the facilities by way of oriental clergy and contact on the ground to bring these pathetic and uh, families to safe havens in those countries we are prepared to have. How many uh, Christians have been brought out of the Middle East with, with your endeavor so far? Well, uh, here at the moment in full flood, but it is uh, a, a very complicated and complex operation. There are two networks, as I said, at work. There's a Jewish network which collects the funds in two ways, on a sort of uh, bottom-up way, various communities uh, in all over the Jewish world will give um, relatively modest sums of money, uh, Manchester, Leeds, Cape Town, Chicago, etc., and also bottom down, and there were a few rich philanthropists, they're producing the money, and we have a brilliant team of Christians who are doing the work of identifying these people, trying to get them out, and bringing them into safe haven. Uh, my intention is to evacuate uh, 2,000 families or 10,000 souls, an average of five or six per family, and bring them to safe havens in different parts of the world. Have you managed to meet with any of these Christians yourself yet? Um, not yet, personally, although my networks have, of course, because I've been dealing with the Jewish network at the moment. We, have a, we also have a very, very fine, excellent coordinator who is a member of an old Catholic English um, banking dynasty called Sir Charles Hall, and he is coordinating all these things for me.
You're obviously watching the situation in the Middle East uh, very, very closely. What was your reaction when, when ISIS first developed? Obviously, uh, you've had connections in the Middle East for a very long time, but is this a, is this a new kind of barbarian, as you called them? It's the worst barbarian it has ever been. I have my uh, sort of, if I may, horrible uh, scale of barbarianism. Um, I make, make them worse than the Holocaust people and make them worse than anything that's ever happened before because they enjoy what they're doing as well as doing the horrible things. You see, the SS, the Nazis used the Holocaust in an industrial operation. So, so many Jews and the some of the dirty work were even done by non-Germans. But, uh, and the, uh, the Russians did it by, by, by sort of the good acts and so on, done in a sort of slovenly way not as systematic, but these people do it and love it, and doing it with great gusto. Therefore, I believe things are the worst of all. You've told other uh, other news sources that you feel that you had a debt to repay to the Christians, and that's why you, you launched this project in the first place. Yes, I have a debt, to, a, du- a dual debt. When I left Nazi Austria as a refugee, it was a family of evangelical Christians called Plymouth Brethren, who took me, took me on as a, like a child of the family, allowed me to continue my studies, and when my father, who was uh, imprisoned, and this is a long story, was released, the, the people were, my family was worried he might be re-arrested uh, in a concentration camp, and so they brought him out by guaranteeing to the British Home Office that he would not be, my parents would not be a burden to, to the taxpayers, so they came over, so they saved my parents' life as well. That was one thing. And the other thing is that I, I was in the privileged position of being a um, regular guest of a group called the Castel Gandolfo group for Pope Pius John Paul II, John, John Paul II, I mean, the Polish Pope Wojtyla, uh, entertained about 25 Jews and Christian academics, intellectuals, and media people every year in this country residence in Castel Gondolfo, we discussed affairs of the world, and he was a very, very close and wonderful friend of the Jews, and coined the famous phrase, the Jew is the elder brother of the church. And I was prompted by these two experiences to say I must do something, if I possibly can, as a Jew, for the Christians persecuted by those barbarians. And this is, of course, why you've chosen Christians to rescue, because some people have criticized you for not rescuing Muslims. I am very furious when I hear this thing. I have a very good record of interfaith cooperation. Mm-hmm. I, I was responsible for founding in Oxford, Cambridge, about 20 visiting chairs on the humanities, one of them on interfaith. And I have also got an interfaith... Um, um, an established institution called the Golden Rings where we give every year a, a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim a golden ring, as it were, not to wear, but put on the mantelpiece for interface cooperation. So I've got a very good record. But I must say that the Christians have a very raw deal. That's why I concentrate. The Muslims in that area have no... I mean, they, they, first of all, they, they have no problem with logistics. If a Muslim is, is persecuted by ISIS, in a, in a taxi ride, he can get into another Muslim country or place of the Muslim world where he's safe. And the money is abundant there. The Christians have no logistical possibilities. They could go around the world, and they have no money. Therefore, you, uh, therefore I reject this, uh, this argument completely. Mm. You obviously, you've, you've, lived, you've lived a very long life, and you've seen at the very beginning of your life uh, the Nazi scourge and what the Nazis did um, to, to millions millions of your people, the Jews. And today we see this sort of anti-Semitism rising again, as well as anti-Christian sentiment. Christians are persecuted all over the world. We see anti-Semitism in pl- some places in Europe. Uh, what do you feel the solution is to a lot of these sentiments that are, that are, are cropping up in, in places that we never thought we'd see them again? Well, as far as anti-Semitism... In, in, in the classical form of anti-Semitism is not really what it used to be. Uh, I will tell you why. What I do see now is jihadism. 
it is whatever is anti-Semitic is really fueled by jihadists and by these terrorist people. And I do believe, I'm terribly have to say, I, I blame Obama a great deal for his lackluster, undulating foreign policy which has made it possible for these people to grow up, grow into what they are now. I'm mm -hmm. very critical of the American president. I have to say that to you. Mm -hmm. He built Putin into a sort of Bismarck and Israeli in, in both uh, in, 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 in um, the Iran conflict and in, and in the, the Middle East generally and has weakened the, the, the defenses against jihadism. And this is just by way of uh, this is my, 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 my hobby horse, if you like. But mm -hmm. still, uh, I do believe that um, the um, Muslims are not endangered because they have somewhere to go. There's a lot of money in the Arab world. Uh, it, 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 there should be much more against ISIS for the practice, but they know how to. They also have no logistical problem. If they're prosecuted, they are taxi rights to another part of the Muslim world where they're safe. But the poor Christians have neither got the money nor the logistical possibilities. They have to go around the world to get past Therefore, it's not fair to compare the two. Mm -hmm. Now we have Vladimir Putin bombing in Syria, and, and the Russians seem to have moved into this place in the Middle East that was more or less evacuated by the Americans. So you're obviously involved in rescue efforts to try and get Christians who lived there for thousands of years out. But do you see the situation improving at all? Is there any end game for the Middle East, or do you think that uh, that conflict is, is one of these ones that will drag on for years? Well, sir, sorry, I d didn't want to use this opportunity of just being to be talking about the American president. Mm -hmm. It's very embarrassing as a British citizen to talk about the leader of a friendly country. But I do, I'm afraid, in all humility, put a lot of what's going wrong now to Obama's undulating and, uh, and unintelligent policy, policy in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Lord George Weddenfield, a 95-year-old member of the British House of Lords and a Holocaust survivor who is seeking to repay his debt to the Christians who rescued him from a Holocaust so many years ago by trying to rescue ch uh, Christians who are now at risk of extermination in the Middle East. And Lord George Weddenfield is not the only man who's trying to rescue Christians. There's another man here in Canada who's made headlines recently for his attempts to actually use teams of negotiators on the ground in the Middle East to ransom, uh, to liberate, as he puts it, uh, Yazidi and Christian children in the Middle East. And he has a, a fantastic handle on what's taking place in the Middle East. His name is Steve Mamana, and he is being referred to as the Jewish Schindler. He's working to rescue young women and children who are being taken by ISIS as slaves, as sex slaves. And he's behind a project that's called The Liberation of Christian and Yazidi Children of Iraq, or CY. CI, and you should uh, immediately Google this organization and take a look at the types of things that they're doing in the Middle East right now. And he has remarkably similar motivations uh, to Lord Weddenfield. What he said uh, to the CBC was that what motivated me is very simple. Being Jewish, being part of a people that actually survived the Holocaust, we for six years waited for people to actually answer the call and to come and help us. And of course, as we know, uh, no one did in many, many cases during the Evian conference of uh, the late 1930s when the leaders of many Western nations sat down to discuss what they would do with the problem of Jewish refugees. Most Western nations slammed their doors shut. In fact, the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King, was, was viciously anti-Semitic and very opposed to allowing Jews to flee the Holocaust by coming to Canada. Of course, we know that we have no shortage of space 
uh, for people to come and settle here. The United States has an awful record on accepting Jews who are fleeing the Holocaust. And, and during this EVN conference, actually, Australia said that we have no Jewish problem and no desire to import one. So uh, Steve Maman, as, as, a, as a Montreal businessman, but, but first and foremost as, as a Jew, has recognized that in some ways history is playing this very sad story out again. Christians are being targeted for extermination. We've heard stories coming out of Iraq and Syria of Jewish doors being painted with the word N for Nazarene. Uh, being literally crucified, as I mentioned before, I, I don't think that we can emphasize these horrors enough, and because we get saturated by the gruesomeness and the horror of the things that we see in the news, and it's really important for us to remember just how brutal uh, these things are, because according to the United Nations, thousands of women and girls have been sold into sex slavery, and nobody really seems to know what to do, except for Steve Maman. He said, and I quote, I decided myself with the Yazidi and Christians that were suffering in the caliphate that it was already too many months that had gone by without reaction. I was going to use the contacts I had on the ground in Iraq and the government contacts. I was going to put those to work and try to put together a plan to start removing those children from harm's way, and I wasn't going to wait for the world to react. And since he launched his project, we've heard many amazing and beautiful stories of children being rescued, children being reunited uh, with their families, children being essentially plucked from the jaws of ISIS, plucked out of the caliphate and placed into safe hands. So again, that is the liberation of Christian and Yazidi children of Iraq. Please do go on the internet, check out their website, and take a look at the work we've been doing. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this conversation uh, between Steve Maman and myself as he tells us what kinds of things are happening on the ground, what sorts of things are being endured by the slaves of ISIS, and what he and his organization and his project are doing about it. The first question is, of course, what made you decide to launch the liberation of Christian and Yazidi children in Iraq? Um, I've noticed the, the suffering that actually was taking place with the Yazidis. Um, you know, in, in Mosul, we saw on, um, through the reports, uh, and I figured we had to interfere and do the best we can in order to help these innocents. And what made you really sit up and take notice, right? There, there are things that go on all around the world, but this, this has really captured the attention uh, of a, a lot of people. I still remember where I was when I heard about the, the crisis of the, of the Yazidi people trapped on, on the mountaintop, for example. What was it especially that made you really sit up and take notice? Um, the, the children that were in a cage, if you recall, there was a photo of children that were crammed up in a cage dressed in orange jumpsuits. Yes. There was an ISIS terrorist outside of that cage holding a torch. All of that was mimicking the Jordanian, Jordanian pilot that was in a cage in an orange jumpsuit as well. We know what happened to the Jordanian pilot, but we do not know what happened to those children. This was the moment that I decided that I was going to actually um, do something for these people. Right, and this is where it gets, it gets really interesting, because many people might want to do something, um, but even if they wanted to, and even if they had, for example, the financial resources to, they wouldn't know how to go about it, especially when we're talking about something as tricky as rescuing children from ISIS. So how did you, uh, well, when you looked at the situation, uh, how did you think that you had you know, the resources and the ability to go about actually getting children out of Iraq and Syria? Great, great, great question. Um, we, have, we actually have an edge over everybody else um, that wishes to help these infants. Canon Andrew White, which is the vicar, was the vicar of Baghdad, had the most um, important security team of Iraq that was given to him by the government of uh, the United States and the UK. It was 36 people strong, um, elites, um, hostage negotiators, etc., and intelligence uh, officers. The, we, through our relationship with Canon Andrew White, were able to secure a part of a team in order to, uh, part of that team, of his team, in order to work and become CYCI agents. And these are the people that we use on the ground in order to uh, negotiate and secure the releases of these innocents uh, that, are, that have been hostage sex slaves at the, uh, in, in Mosul, in the caliphate. 
Well, it's interesting. We actually spoke with uh, Canon Andrew White some time ago, and if, if I'm not mistaken, he's left Iraq now because it's so dangerous for Westerners. Do your, your negotiators find that it's far more dangerous now than it was even just a few months ago? Well, well the, the great thing is that we were able to inherit his team because he left Iraq. This is how we got uh, to have his team be made available for CYCI. Was he still in Iraq? Obviously, we couldn't use his team. He would be using them himself. So this is how we inherited the team. Now, is it more dangerous? Obviously, yes, because at the time when Cannon White was there, the only problem for him was Al-Qaeda. ISIS, you know, took over swiftly in 2014 in the month of August. And obviously, this became a, uh, a situation where he himself could not remain in, in Iraq uh, any longer. It was way too dangerous for him as well. And so with you, with you having the team on the ground in Iraq, and, and, and to the extent that you can, of course, on the air, could you just tell us how you get the children out in a sort of a step-by-step fashion? So you, you obviously raised the funds, and you've put a lot of your own funds into this, and then you commission negotiators that you've got from Cannon White on the ground. What's the next step? How do they contact ISIS? How do they get the children? The next step are, are, are simple. The... Our team, we're going to call it the CYCI team, has contact and links on the inside of the caliphate. These are other teams that, that work with us in order to secure release of innocents that are in Mosul. Once they have uh, possession of these uh, um, people that were held hostage, they meet the CYCI team at the border of Mosul and, the, uh, in other words, the caliphate and Iraq. And we, uh, the exchange occurs there. They hand them over to our teams. Have you been there yourself? No. I was supposed to be there a month ago, and, uh, on a, and the, uh, the trip was canceled on the day um, that we were traveling for security reasons, so I couldn't make it. Okay. So what sorts of contacts uh, do, do you have with an ISIS? So they're obviously going back and forth on money, and you said that it's anywhere from two to $3,000 to rescue one Christian or Yazidi child. and. And the, the ISIS caliphate obviously has billions of dollars in oil revenue, and, and they're now, they have now have in their possession some of you know, the world's greatest historical treasures. So do you think you're actually dealing with, uh, with ISIS as a caliphate, such as it is and however it can be described? Or rather, are you just dealing with individuals who are really willing to give up children for a ransom? Because obviously what you're paying is far higher than they would get on the slave market. Okay, there's a few points in your in, your, in what you just uh, questioned. First of all, there are no more slave markets. The slave markets occurred only at the very early beginnings of the ISIS takeover of the caliphate. Mm-hmm. Since then, there hasn't been any there hasn't been any uh, slave market that has operated. At the early stages, the girls were sold from fifty dollars to two hundred fifty dollars at the market. Right. Then. We're going to push forward numerous months. CYCI is founded. There is no more slave market. We have teens looking for girls that have been bought by civilians as well as ISIS sympathizers. We're going to call them, you know, jihadists or sympathizers. CYCI does not deal with ISIS. CYCI has never dealt with ISIS. CYCI has never paid ISIS for anything that has to do with our work in Iraq. We have no relationship at all. We've never had a relationship. So this is clear, so you, know, so you understand exactly where we stand. The only relationships we have are with our corresponding teams of moderate Muslim intelligence on the inside of the caliphate. This is thanks to our you know, highly trained team of CYCI that used to be part of the, of the Canon and Y team. They had relationships all over the country. Now, at this point, the the owners of these slaves are civilians mainly, and the, a smaller percentage are ISIS sympathizers that bought these girls in order to have, you know, I guess, extramarital sex and, you know, and eventually, you know, fulfill their fantasies with young children that are powerless. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, these people want to return these children. They're, they're openly uh, 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 releasing these children to their families through teams that actually take them and bring them back to the caliphate. The expenses that we incur 
that CYCI incurs and that the teams, the corresponding teams incur, are related specifically to security, to logistics, to armored vehicle rentals and teams in order to bring securely these girls out to meet us. And then from our uh, meeting point, we need to return them to Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where most of the expenses go. There is no such a thing as a buying back those slaves. Uh, nobody buys them back. You, you negotiate the release of these girls back. That's, and let's not forget that they are Iraqi citizens. They are not just a Yazidi nation in the middle of Iraq. They, are, they were in Iraq way before Islam existed, way before Kurds existed. Uh, they, they have been in, in, in Nineveh, the Nineveh province, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the point that the Iraqis are making, the teams are making, uh, is that we do not pay to release an Iraqi citizen from another Iraqi citizen that took advantage of taking a girl. It's already bad enough that he's actually taken that girl and abused her for the past year. Uh, and the, uh, based on that, there's negotiations where the releases happen very, very peacefully, and there is no payment exchange with these orders. So you said the slave markets only existed at the very beginning when the when the ISIS invasions first took place. So what happens now when ISIS conquers new territory? Well, they don't. They do not conquer any, any new territory. Have you seen them conquering new territory since August of 2014? Not, not since August. They've they've uh, apparently gotten close to the Turkish border once or twice in their in their in their fight near Syria. You're talking about the city of Kobani. The city of yes. Kobani um, was actually being fought. They took over a part of the city, then they lost it again. But don't, let's not forget, before they took over the city of Kobani, all of its inhabitants had already fled. It was already empty. All there were were, fight, were Kurdish fighters fighting to keep the city. Um, they had not taken hostages there. In other words, let me just explain it clearly to you. Mm -hmm. There are... The, the, the ISIS is, is surrounded by the Kurds and the Peshmerga to, at, the nor, at, at the north position. Right behind them is Turkey. To the east, you have the Americans and the Peshmerga army from the KRG government. To the south, you have the Americans as well as the Iraqi forces. And to the west, you have Hezbollah with the, uh, you know, with, uh, with the Iranians that are there in order to make sure that they do not you know, come into Syria to take any more territory. So in front of all of these forces surrounding them, ISIS only has about 30 to 50,000 soldiers. I mean, how do you expect them to be able to fight all of these world forces around them at this point? So what they're concentrating on, actually, is maintaining and keeping and protecting the caliphate. They do not seek to expand. So, you know, there is no expansion. There is no more potential uh, hostage-taking situations because they have nowhere to go at this point. Right. So how, how many uh, children did they manage to, to kidnap prior uh, to these? Eight, uh, the estimates are 8,000 8, uh, children and women uh, were, were, were taken hostage. And how many has your organization managed to liberate so far? Uh, we've managed to liberate 135 uh, so far. The, the, um, there are three, they say there is between 2,700 and 3,000 left in the caliphate. That was an estimate that was, two mo that was done two months ago by the uh, United Nations. It's also the estimate that the KRT government and everybody else uses at this point. So my best, my best guess is that there are 2,500 children left I mean, 2,500 innocents left uh, within the caliphate as hostages uh, until now. We actually liberated uh, a 15-year-old a child today from the, uh, the uh, Mosul uh, caliphate, and she was brought back to the Hook to meet her family, and all this occurred under the cameras of one of the biggest news, um, news outlets of North America, which actually came down to Kurdistan in order, in order to make a documentary about CYCI. But they witnessed all the work. It was just a spectacular uh, liberation. Yes. So uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, fear about ISIS, and, and some of it's, it's misplaced, and there's a lot of things that are still flying around the Internet about ISIS and ISIS slave markets and things like that that might not 
reflect the situation on the ground. But as I understand it, you, uh, you and your team actually interview the children after they are liberated and you hear about uh, their actual experiences. What are you hearing from them? Well, um, you want to know the truth. I get, the, I get the documents. We actually interview them and do what we call liberation documents right. with them. There's, it's a questionnaire. You must have seen on my website. And that questionnaire has all the important questions that one may ask somebody who is liberated from, you know, from ISIS or from a civilian within the ISIS caliphate. Um, we, I never wanted to read the actual uh, um, cases, uh, I mean, the actual details of what occurred to them, what they declared to us. Um, it's already very difficult for me to to know what happens when we see them come out, and the teams know what occurred to them, but I prefer not to know. It just pushes me forward to continue working. For the first time last week with Global News, uh, which was here for an interview, they're, making also, they're also making a documentary about, about us. Uh, we read together for the first time what occurred to these people that we've actually liberated. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to tell you that the, the suffering is, is terrible. The, the amount of pain that they go through, some girls have been sold three times, four times, five times. Um, some girls have had, you know, virginity reconstruction surgeries done to them so they could be exchanged with other owners that wanted to rape a new girl because they were set up of raping the same girl for the, you know, for a certain amount of time. So they were like, seeking new, uh, new thrills. So it became a fashion within the caliphate where people would exchange contracts. These girls are owned, they're owned by contract, making them property of, of the owner holding the contract with her name. So they would basically exchange contracts and, you know, so these girls repeatedly got, you know, got traded. Very difficult to read the statements that they wrote. I mean, it's, it's very painful. How, how successful have you been at managing to reunite children with their parents? I think that our, 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 so far we must have a 75% success rate in finding families uh, for them. We don't just take them out and drop them at the corner of the street. Mm -hmm. We try to relocate their village. If their village has been destroyed, we actually try to find details of the whereabouts in the, or the camp that their families have been reassigned to. And we, do, we always end up finding neighbors or friends or families and we actually film those moments where we go look for these people with the uh, people that were liberated. And sometimes we, we have footage where people thought, you know, meet their mother, meet their father for the first time after a year. They just, you know, it, the, we have some very, very, uh, you know, very incredible footage that is very difficult to watch because it's, it's, it's authentic. It's taken on the moment. And it's, all, again, it's on our YouTube or on our Facebook page or on our website. It's, it's there for the world to see. That's what hap what's happening to these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one final question. Obviously, uh, uh, liberation is, is the first and, and the most important step for these children. And uh, after, after they're reunited with families, do you have any idea of, of how they managed to cope with what they went through, how they returned to living some semblance of a normal life after the horrors that you described? A month ago, the United Nations made a report that 90 suicides on average a month uh, you know, were occurring in the uh, Kurdistan area, mainly from women and mainly from Yazidis. It's, it's, it's very sad to say, but the Yazidis actually welcome their daughters, even though they've been raped or they were pregnant with, with, with children from ISIS or from civil, civilians that raped them. And they would welcome them back very, very, with open arms. Um, so, so the culture accepts a child who's already been raped, and it, it won't be an issue as far as honor to the family, like it could be in other religions. Mm -hmm. Sadly, there, are, there is a lack of medical help. There is a lack of psychologists. There is a lack of social workers on the ground that speak the language in order to help these people cope with what they've lived. Right. Obviously, we take them away from, the, from the, this horrific uh, um, uh, life that they've lived there, so we took them out. But it's far from being enough from them, 
to stay alive at a financial level and at a, at a health level, at a medical level, at a well-being level. It's very difficult for them. And this is where I decry the world, the world leaders that are not doing enough for these people is that we haven't, we haven't seen countries mobilize to go and supply help to these camps. There's millions of people in those camps, and all of them have a story to tell. And it's not the typical story that we would have to tell if we had a, a very uh, difficult moment. These people actually saw their husbands' heads being, uh, you know, being sawed off in front of them, in front of their children. So you have children there that actually saw a father losing, uh, losing, uh, losing a head in front of them. I mean, how does a child cope with that type of picture in his mind? Mm -hmm. uh, forget about mo mothers and, and, and wives and, and, and girls, because starting from the age of nine years old, they actually get raped. That's the law. The law in the, in the caliphate, a girl is, 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 is a, I mean, I'm going to use a word, sadly, it's, she's sellable. You could sell her from the age of nine years old. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't get sold to be sitting, you know, she gets sold to be a sex slave. That's what, that's what they do. So how do you actually expect a nine-year-old child to have the mechanisms in order to survive such an old, even if we took her out, you know, she's still deep inside her, she's still there. Yes, we physically took her out, but emotionally, she's definitely still inside the caliphate. And this is where we need to raise awareness to the world that it's not just a genocide of killing, it's a genocide that has brought a terrible amount of pain to people that are still alive. It's very difficult. So what can people do to help? People should um, donate money to causes. They have to verify the causes. They have to be you know, valid causes. Mm -hmm. um, CYCI specifically caters to two, two things. CYCI caters to liberate, liberating these innocents, and 15% of what we raise goes to humanitarian aid of the people we actually liberate in order to help them get resettled and, and have a decent amount of money, at least a start, to restart their lives. Mm -hmm. But the, we, don't, we do not get involved with the medical aspect. We don't have the means financially. We, don't have the, we do not have the know-how for it. The best thing one can do is to actually help financially and, and push government wherever you're, wherever you're at in order for the government to do, to act, um, to act, to send teams there. Governments could send teams. Canada, the, the Conservative Party has actually pledged to give $140 million to Kurdistan in order to help these innocents. So our country has actually stepped up to, stepped up to the plate, but it's one of the only countries that did. What about the rest of the world? I mean... Right. To, what, what could we do? We've got to put pressure on the world. We've got, we got to create awareness. We should not let these people live another Holocaust. Six million Jews in 1939 to 1945 was enough. Six years. It took six years to, to help. Six, uh, six years and six million people that died, mm -hmm. that were killed, that were slaughtered in the camps. Why do we have to wait again in 2015? We cannot use the excuse that was used in those years saying we didn't know, we didn't, we, we didn't realize it was that bad. These were the excuses. Today, we all know, you and I, we both know what's happening to these people. Right. Question is, are we going to act or are we going to remain spectators? That's it. One needs to ask himself that question. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Steve Maman of the Project The Liberation of Christian and Yazidi Children of Iraq, telling us uh, what's going on the ground and uh, what his organization uh, are doing actually in the Middle East to rescue uh, children, to rescue women uh, from ISIS. And I hope you found this as enlightening and as inspiring as I do, because I know that I've often read the news headlines and felt quite helpless about uh, what I can do. And I think that this story also has a fascinating element to it when you consider that these are, are, are two Jewish men launching huge projects to rescue children who are, uh, rescue women and children of the Christian faith who are at risk from the same types 
of, of genocidal attitudes that once motivated the Nazis to murder six million of their people. It's always good, I think, when we see headlines like this to, to recognize the horror, but also to try look at who is doing something about it, to look for inspiring stories, to look for beautiful stories, so that we can commit ourselves to reach out and help the same thing. And if we don't know how to react ourselves to these horrific situations, I think that assisting the efforts of, of people like Lord George Weddenfield and Steve Maman right here in Canada is a very good start. We've, we're going to be having more interviews in, in the coming days about the situation in the Middle East, uh, how we should be understanding the situation, and what we can do to help. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we really hope that you'll join us again next week on Thursday at 3 p.m. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great weekend.